Good afternoon. It is my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of Solid Care Lab and the Institute for Philosophy and Social Theory. Our today's guest is our colleague Sergei Shevchenko. Welcome, Sergei. He is currently a visiting scholar here at the Institute for Philosophy and Social Theory and at our lab. He has a PhD in philosophy of medicine and a master in biology. His research focuses on the epistemic injustice in healthcare and ethical and social issues of human enhancement. He is also founder of the Observatory for Comparative Bioethics, Independent Institute of Philosophy Association in Paris, France. His today's talk is titled Lost in Time and Space, Migration, Drug Addiction and Epistemic Injustice. Without further ado, Sergei, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm very glad to have this opportunity to share with you my uh, work in progress. Um, and I hope uh, uh, everyone of you uh, uh, had uh, a perfect lunch, so you will enjoy uh, election. Uh, I also hope that people on Zoom are also uh, capable uh, to hear me well. Uh, so you're welcome to intervene with uh, any critics, uh, with any um, uh, comments and of course questions. I will try to speak around 45 minutes. Uh, uh, my uh, lecture will be divided uh, in two um, parts i guess the main part the main conceptual part is force where i will present uh, my own uh, conceptual um, outcomes like bioethical outcomes and so on in conclusion and in the force part while the uh, beginning of uh, my lecture is not normative but descriptive it is about relevance of the topic about uh, uh, non places and uh, refugees. It is also some kind of uh, very brief introduction to to, to the to, to the topic. Why uh, all these uh, three issues like migration, like uh, drug dependence, and uh, epistemic injustice are interrelated. And uh, here will be also brief uh, in the third point. Uh, very brief. Um, overview of uh, temporal focus or of what is called uh, addiction studies. Uh, I must also uh, say a few words about the wording. Uh, I use the word addiction uh, here. However, I know that the experts uh, from the field, they tend to use the word drug dependence. However, uh, as a philosopher of medicine, um, I just obliged to, to use uh, the word that is used in the field, in the uh, healthcare, in the uh, medical uh, literature. So uh, I use this uh, to uh, mark uh, the field uh, in which uh, I am going uh, to delve. So uh, here are some starting points uh, of my uh, presentation. Uh, what will I? Uh, what I'm going to speak about? Um, uh, about unique temporal uh, experience of uh, people with uh, drug dependence, and uh, uh, it is also highlighted uh, by the experience of uh, forced migration, of being a refugee, of being in known places. Uh, and uh, that is why it uh, underscores uh, these uh, peculiar features of uh, uh, temperate experience of people with uh, drug dependence. And of course, uh, much more about epistemic injustice. Um, I'm writing, uh, still writing a paper uh, about uh, this topic with my colleague, uh, who uh, I hope uh, joined via Zoom, uh, Alexei Javrenko from Frankfurt. Uh, he's more uh, also into some theoretical speculations uh, about epistemic injustice. So I will not uh, pay much attention towards uh, uh, the overview of different uh, theories of epistemic injustice, 
but if you have any questions please uh ask me i will <laughs> give all all possible information that that, that that i have at the moment about this so uh, why the topic of uh being in a known place having specific temporal experience and being a uh, drug addict and being uh somehow uh excluded uh, as a drug addict is relevant now and i think it will become even more relevant of course uh because of the uh current uh, picture of the field uh, here is general statistics from world drug report um, it was published uh, this year but uh, the statistics is more about uh, 2021 as uh, as you can see because uh, it is hard uh, to combine all, all the um, statistic um, about uh, last year you see uh, the growth you see that uh, uh, Eastern Europe and North America are uh, the top places, are two, uh, two uh, subregions uh, with the highest uh, prevalence of people who inject drugs. Um, of course, we are not in the Eastern Europe, and uh, the picture here on the Balkans uh, is uh, very different uh, from Eastern Europe. However, I think uh, Eastern Europe becomes um an area where migration occurs uh and where the problem uh that i will, will be speaking about is uh becoming even more harsh due to the migration uh first of all um, that is uh, related to ukrainian uh war so uh sorry for mistake uh you see that opioids are the main uh, risk factor uh, for health care, for health of uh, people who are using uh, drugs. It is a rather good medical statistical marker. Uh, years of uh, healthy life, uh, years of life um, that are um, kind of scored uh, in the equivalence uh, to, to the healthy lives that uh, were uh, lost due to the uh, opioid uh, consumption. You, you see that uh, here is uh, direct uh, uh, use of uh, quality of life and longevity uh, here um linked with uh opioid use and uh, also there is uh, indirect uh, risks like uh, hepatitis uh, cirrhosis and uh, uh, some other and also uh, hiv or aids are also uh, of course linked with uh, injection of uh, drugs uh, so here is uh, also, uh, this uh, slide is also taken from World Drug Report. You can see uh, the, the general statistics. So uh, more than uh, 12, around 13 uh, million of deaths um, uh, of years uh, of healthy life are mm, lost due to uh, this problem. Uh, and here I'm uh, going uh, closer to the main topic of my presentation, drug use and forced migration. So uh, you see, it is also from World Drug Report. It is uh, kind of quotes with uh, very uh, uh, shy and short uh, marks. Uh, you see that um, the picture is... Um, ambivalent uh, the war have uh, has disrupted existing uh, routes for heroin and cocaine uh, but uh, synthetic drugs became uh, a more relevant more actual problem in the area of the conflict because uh, uh, yes it is hard to um, 
um, go into uh, into this area, but uh, people have a possibility to produce synthetic drugs uh, in the region, and it is also can be linked uh, with the comparable risks as an opioid consumption. And of course, uh, people who are fleeing uh, uh, from war or who are experiencing the war in the uh, in the country, uh, they uh, have an issues with accessibility of uh, health services. So, what we can see about uh, uh, availability, accessibility, better to see uh, the harm reduction options uh, for the refugees from Ukraine. Um, it is another source, uh, the main source is a uh, harm reduction uh, report uh, from the uh, previous year. Uh, you can see that uh, there are some, there are different issues uh, people are facing when they're fleeing uh, from war and having uh, drug dependence. First of them is uh, they need uh, some kind of additional approval from the Ministry of Health uh, to start um, one of the option of uh, harm reduction, uh, antiretroviral therapy, you see. Um, I tend to concentrate here more on kind of Balkan region. Uh, in Romania, you see uh, there is uh, very low funding for opioid agonist therapy. It is kind of a contemporary term for uh, uh, methadone therapy or something like this. Uh, but of course, uh, people who are into harm reduction who are experts, they tend to call it uh, opioid agonist therapy. Um, or, but it is very oversimplifying. It is like uh, um, substitution of uh, opioids like heroin to uh, methadone, uh, just for understanding of their uh, audience. And uh, of course, uh, in some places, uh, there are also issues with the availability of uh, support services. And uh, as many people went uh, also to Russia from from Ukraine uh, fleeing from war because uh, probably they had uh, relatives uh, there or um, used some other reasons. The situation even before the war was insufficient uh, in terms of uh, harm reduction. Uh, that was one of my topics. Um, I and my colleague uh, uh, published a paper in um, rather big uh, Russian uh, philosophical journal, uh, Issues in Philosophy, called in Russian Vapros of uh, Philosophy, uh, about why in Russia there is no any uh, significant harm reduction program um, that is funded by the state. Of course, there are funds, um, but uh, there is no systemic work. And uh, as we pointed out, it is linked also uh, with uh, epistemic injustice. And I guess this form of epistemic injustice, like willful hermeneutical ignorance, is um, one of the causes of many issues uh, in not only in healthcare, but uh, in the um, in the whole Russian society. Okay, uh, here is one of the main uh, point uh, that I kindly ask you uh, to um, you know, um, to keep in your memory. Um, it's about uh, the thesis is availability does not mean accessibility. Uh, so, okay, uh, in some countries, uh, harm reduction options uh, are available, but uh, first of all, oh, for example, in North Macedonia, uh, people should have uh, local uh, government issued identity documents uh, to apply for uh, for it. And uh, you see uh, here, um, a person should be registered as a drug user. 
Uh, and of course, uh, it is linked with uh, different uh, social, economical, political, and some other uh, legal predicaments in, uh, in the human life, just to be registered as a uh, drug user. Um, but what I would like to underscore is uh, availability of uh, programs in, for example, Poland. Uh, yes, they have uh, rather big amount of centers uh, for harm reduction for uh, opioid uh, agonist therapy, for example. But uh, uh, imagine that uh, refugee or a regular citizen uh, of Poland is living like here or here. Uh, this person will be obliged to cover around uh, uh, 500, uh, 150 uh, kilometers daily just uh, to um, receive the opioid agonies. And um, I think that uh, it is really hard uh, to, to cope with. Because imagine uh, that, uh, okay, you have uh, okay good trains, for example, from here to Gdansk to Warsaw, you have uh, uh, perfect centers, but uh, uh, just uh, to make uh, time management for it, just to um, figure out how you can make your time budget for this, I think it is... Uh, People living here, uh, they have uh, option of harm reduction available, but not uh, fully accessible. So I'm going to uh, the second part uh, of my uh, presentation about uh, refugees' experience and experience of being in known places. So uh, known places, uh, this uh, concept is... Uh, uh, rather new, but uh, it stemmed from uh, a, a little bit from uh, uh, other concepts like abstract places. Um, Lefebvre uh, has coined uh, this uh, term. Uh, he understand uh, that uh, there are kind of monofunctional spaces in our urban life. Um, places that are designed for purposes of circulation, uh, for example, consumption or uh, just circulation like transportation and administration. Um, it is an abstract place, place with um, only one function. And uh, a non-place, uh, um, rather more... Uh, modern term and uh, widely recognized term. Uh, it denotes uh, a liminal space uh, in which uh, person can, uh, in which you just uh, don't know what to do. Uh, you have no any relations like historical, um, uh, emotional in, in the sense of emotional atmosphere that uh, this place have um, and uh, this place doesn't have uh, any identity you see that uh, such different uh, spaces places like uh, highways airports and refugee centers are called non-places so uh, as in a very mm -mm, uh, I guess, uh, well-known uh, cinema, uh, the terminal or person can only wait there without uh, living her or his life. So um, uh, the only thing uh, that a person can do in a refugee camp is, uh, or doing as a refugee is waiting because uh, uh, this person uh, waits uh, use from home, uh, legal determination of uh, uh, of their status, and uh, uh, probably the next uh, Syria or next arrival of uh, some aid, 
and of course, uh, the peaceful future for their homeland. Uh, that is a quote from the doctoral dis dissertation about Myanmar uh, migrants in Thailand. Uh, you see that uh, uh, the present for these people becomes only tool for uh, life, for working towards uh, future life, uh, life to be. Uh, what I would like also to emphasize here, uh, waiting is not a free time, empty or uneventful time of person with drug dependence is not a time of boredom. It's, it's not time that, uh, okay, uh, any one of us has and uh, um, we, we just uh, don't know how to devote uh, this time to anything productive or amusing, but empty time uh, for uh, people, a person with a drug addiction is a really separate uh, uh, thing. It is comparable, really comparable to this kind of uh, experience of the present of living in the in a refugee camp. Uh, uh, so, uh, sorry, one more mistake. One need uh, to synchronize uh, as a refugee and as a person with drug dependence with many different things. It is really hard um, uh, to make um, the adequate time budget for uh, these um, many dimensions of synchronization, like caring for uh, relatives, uh, for your uh, relatives in exile that are living uh, near with you, supporting friends uh, from other time zones, because majority of people have gone to other time zones while uh, they have communication uh, that is uh, uh, just uh, linked to their previous, the, the time zone of their homeland. Um, of course, uh, interaction with the local administration uh, is also a big deal. Uh, I guess uh, every person that uh, have interacted with um, living abroad and interacted with uh, some kind of administration has uh, such kind of uh, unique experience of uh, waiting and uh, of uh, doing something, being too time pressed just to, to make some documents in a couple of days. And of course, seeking uh, harm reduction uh, programs and uh, uh, using, uh, for example, opioid agonist therapy also um, consumes very big amount of time. So I will uh, go to the uh, third topic, uh, temporal focus of uh, uh, addiction studies. I would like, uh, of course, it is not a systematic review of uh, healthcare literature, but I want to uh, underscore uh, some points about uh, what we can find in this literature because this literature is really uh, focused, uh, the part, the significant part of the literature is really focused on temporalities because uh, some scholars uh, define addiction as a temporal disorder or disorder of temporality. I will not uh, like to delve into discussion whether drug dependency is disorder order of choice or some kind of psychiatric disorder or disorder of volition or uh, disorder of cognition. There are di different points of view, but um, it is these um, discussions are not, uh, these debates are not uh, actual for the, the current topic. So, uh, uh, scholars in uh, addiction studies define uh, drug dependence or how they call it drug addiction as a result of uh, hyper-presentification 
It means that the present uh, plays a very significant role comparing with future in the past. Uh, I guess they mean that uh, person, uh, they see mm, the present uh, drug use at the uh, primarily uh, valuable act in uh, their life. Um, drug dependence is also seen as an outcome of uh, desire to detach uh, one's lifestyle from uh, linear, regular, uh, regular and uh, acceler accelerated tempor temporality of social life, excuse me. Um, and uh, of course, uh, there are many, there were many um, papers about uh, uh, how people with uh, drug dependence, they tend uh, to use uh, drugs for uh, controlling uh, their time flow, for synchronizing with uh, um, the rest of society through using uh, substances uh, that uh, slowing down uh, the passage of time or vice versa. Um, make it uh, uh, more uh, fast. Uh, you see, it, it was uh, it is paper from uh, 70s, but uh, this topic was uh, still actual like uh, 20 years ago. I don't know why now people are not uh, speculating about this. Uh, drug addiction, uh, the experience of drug addiction is experience of uh, specific, uh, very significant temporalities uh, that uh, people um, often don't know how to express. Uh, there are some uh, papers um, speaking about that uh, uh, people with uh, who use methadone, they uh, have a specific uh, chronotope in their self-narratives, like specific temporal and spatial modes of presenting uh, their life, their experience, uh, that... Uh, uh, they uh, they have specific patterns uh, of emotional change, and uh, they try to describe these patterns in their uh, narratives. And uh, sometimes they uh, lack conceptual resources to do this. And of course, uh, some individuals uh, using opiates uh, describe uh, the period of addiction as an isolation. Uh, from the uh, social life because it is uh, for some people it is a way for synchronizing but for other people it is uh, a way to be isolated from traumatic experience uh, so um a scholar also from uh, Poland, uh, Maskalewicz, he has uh, plenty uh, papers about uh, experience of uh, people with drug dependence, uh, especially uh, temporal experience and uh, experience of uh, healing, of uh, being helped in some healthcare institutions. And... Uh, um, he uh, often speaks about uh, three dimensions of uh, such kind of temporalities, uh, like uh, temporal features of cognitive process, uh, individual temporal experience uh, manifested in narratives, and uh, uh, social temporality of uh, drug use in communities and uh, um something like this so i will try right now to link uh these three dimensions uh with uh, different forms of epistemic injustice so we are going into uh the most uh, uh conceptualized and kind of normative uh, part of my presentation because previously i was uh 
um, trying to give an overview of uh, what does it mean uh, for people having drug dependence to, to have specific uh, temporal experience. Uh, so, okay, uh, here is um, a rather short um, definition of uh, epistemic injustice. This term was coined by Miranda Fricker and uh, her book about epistemic injustice is one of the top cited uh, books in social epistemology and uh, I guess in the philosophy overall. Uh, she um, she is speaking about two forms of uh, epistemic injustice, testimonial and hermeneutical. Uh, testimonial injustice, uh, it means uh, preventing testimony or decreasing one's uh, credibility. Freakers uh, refers to uh, the novel uh, To Kill the Mockingbird, uh, uh, where um, African American is uh, going to testify uh, in the court in, in the middle of 20th century or in, even in the first half of 20th century. And of course, because of his uh, color, his credibility is uh, decreased. So it is something about negative stereotypes. Uh, while hermeneutical uh, injustice is more about misunderstanding. Uh, Fricker um, refers to a very short uh, vignette uh, about uh, sexual harassment. Imagine that uh, there is a rather old uh, but uh, good willing uh, boss uh, male and uh, um, young female working for him uh, comes to him and uh, she um, tells about uh, sexual harassment from uh, uh, her colleague and boss asks okay was there any violence uh, she says no okay does he use some derogative words towards you she also tells no and so uh, boss uh, cannot recognize any problem in uh, her complaint uh, because he misunderstands the word harassment he doesn't have this concept in his mind but uh, it can be willful or unwillful uh, uh freaker uh, mostly speaking about uh un unwillful uh hermeneutical injustice but uh in feminist studies there is a very strong and rather uh, good concept uh, of willful hermeneutical ignorance when uh a person just uh, pretending not to understand or uh, not giving a any epistemic uh, um, efforts to understand one's own uh, complaint, uh, testament, uh, or uh, something like this. Um, there is uh, also a good uh, concept uh, of hermeneutical domination coined by Amandine Ketela from Canada. Uh, this means that uh, dominant groups in society, uh, they uh, tend to uh, pro prioritize their own conceptual resources, their own conceptualization towards uh, subaltern groups. So sometimes uh, people from non-dominant groups, they don't have uh, uh, perfect uh, conceptualization of uh, some kind of uh, okay, legal, ethical, moral uh, concept. So they can't use uh, this concept for um, uh, sharing their experience of being a part of uh, some kind of subaltern part of society. And uh, pathocentric uh, epistemic injustice, uh, um, this uh, term coined by Carol and Keed uh, from Great Britain, 
I think also are intending to speak about testimonial and hermeneutical injustice, uh, patocentric injustice, uh, it is uh, epistemic injustice towards a person like a client, a patient of uh, healthcare institutions. So um, here I want to compare different um, dimensions of temporal experience like here it's uh, based uh, drawing from Maskalevich's uh, paper and uh, uh, different forms of epistemic injustice of course uh, we can say uh, that uh, um, some stereotypes concerning the temporal feature of uh, cognitive process of people with drug dependence is linked uh, only with testimonial injustice. But primarily it is about, as it is about stereotypes, it is about testimonial injustice. I will uh, give you examples a little bit further. Uh, individual temporal experience that people want to uh, share in their narratives is, of course, uh, connected with hermeneutical injustice or misinterpretation of their narratives or uh, misinterpretation during uh, the diagnosis, during the communi doctor-patient communication and so on. So we have a question of what can be linked, what type of epistemic injustice can be linked with social temporality. So, uh, you see that um, there was a big discussion in uh, philosophy and bioethics about uh, autonomy and uh, temporal features of cognitive process of people with drug addiction. Uh, very uh, prominent uh, article called uh, Cynthia's Dilemma by Charland, uh, where he speaks about um, his argument is that people with drug dependence uh, cannot refuse uh, from uh, using substance when they have uh, this substance in front of them because they are addicted. So um, that is why uh, one cannot ask uh, some kind of permission for um, some healthcare or intervention for people with drug addiction. So the philosophical background of this view is linked with a very uh, also prominent Frankfurt's, Harry Frankfurt's arguments about uh, uh, true volition, true desire. Uh, I am oversimplifying his arguments, of course, but uh, the, the basic idea, his basic idea is that our true desires are our second-order desires, what we desire to desire, what we wish to wish. Uh, so uh, people uh, cannot, uh, people with drug dependence cannot control uh, their life. Um, they have um, truly desire, second-order desire, to control their life and probably to stop uh, drug use or to at least to control drug use but according to the uh, uh this uh, dilemma they cannot resist the temptation and uh, that is why uh, they are acting uh, not uh uh, just according to their long-term goals, but according to temptation that they have at the moment. And that is why their autonomy, like bioethical autonomy, is diminished. They uh, don't have, uh, in majority of cases, the right to decide. Uh, but uh, in... Uh, 2006, um, bioethical and neuroethical uh, debates about uh, drug addiction and autonomy uh, began, and uh, such um, famous uh, neuroethicists as Neil Levy and uh, Julian Savalescu were 
uh, of course, well known uh, by ethicists from uh, primarily from Britain. Uh, they uh, spoke. Um, uh, they contradicted this uh, Cynthia's dilemma, this view about uh, uh, autonomy of uh, people with drug addicts. They contradicted, uh, to be in the short, uh, these uh, negative stereotypes. And they told that people, okay, uh, they have temptation, but they um, can meet the strictest uh, criteria of uh, competence of autonomy most of the time. Of course, there is no a person who meets this uh, criteria all the time. Um, okay, each of us can be uh, frightened, uh, can be just falling asleep, uh, can be drunk or something like this. Uh, and uh, that is why majority of us uh, don't meet this criteria all the time, most of the time. And um, the picture is comparable you know, when we are speaking about uh, people with drug addiction. And uh, also, uh, I would like to uh, pay your attention to uh, Hannah Picard's uh, works. Uh, she's um, a very interesting uh, philosopher. Uh, writing about uh, drug dependence, drug addiction, and uh, in uh, uh, one of her papers, uh, she writes about the value of a subject of value, personal value of drugs for people who use them. Not majority of them are trying to, they see uh, drugs as something uh, completely evil, um, they they trying to control their lives, but not to or refuse from good sides of uh, using drugs. Because uh, okay, people uh, using drugs they are not uh, uh, incompetent. Uh, they have a possibility to distinguish between uh, good and evil for them, and of course they, they see some valuable features in using drugs. For example, in uh, uh, controlling uh, uh, the time flow, as I've mentioned, or in uh, just integrating in some communities or just recreation or something like this. What about the enhancements? Uh, is typically related to the... Okay, that, that is a good that, that is a good question. Of course, uh, there is uh, also um, the practice of using uh, amphetamine uh, as an academic doping in the American universities, and of course, uh, it is also uh, an example of. Uh, personal value of uh, drug consumption. So Hannah Picard, uh, she's uh, contradicting other part of Cynthia's dilemma that uh, uh, people uh, have these truly desires. And while uh, Savalescu and Levy, they are uh, contradicting the outcome of the dilemma that uh, people don't have autonomy. So uh, nowadays, uh, the a widely spread view is, of course, that people have autonomy. They have right uh, to decide, have right to choose um, the means of harm reduction, means of uh, forms of opioid agonist therapy, but not completely, of course, the design new form. But, uh, of course, they are competent uh, to uh, give, um, um, to refuse or... Um, to go into these programs. Uh, so uh, speaking about uh, the second uh, dimension of uh, temporalities, the predicaments with the uh, narratives, with the communication of uh, specific temporal experience. Uh, here I would like uh, to emphasize only one uh, instrument of diagnostics or of measuring uh, the uh, kind of healing process. Uh, 
uh, Zimbard uh, time perspective inventory. It was uh, in introduced by uh, Philip Zimbard, a very uh, also famous uh, psychiatrist. Uh, you know, his uh, <laughs> probably his experiments, like. Uh, uh and um, there is also a big discussion about the the, the morality the ethical um the dimension of uh, his experience but uh, there was no uh, such uh, debates concerning his uh, time pe perspective uh, instruments uh but um, they are widely used uh, to uh, measure healthcare outcomes, and uh, we have uh, an evidence from uh, healthcare literature, even from uh, systematic reviews, I guess even from Cochrane re reviews, that these surveys are good instruments for measuring healthcare outcomes. By that, they are not good, they are not proper instruments for understanding uh their uh time experience of people uh, uh so uh, you see that uh zara um to implications of uh, using uh, this uh, scale that uh, time flow is uh, uh kind of linear but uh, people with drug dependence uh, they tell that they have uh uh, cyclic, cyclical uh, temporal experience sometimes they see uh, that, that that is a problem and uh, of course uh, Zimbardo is not uh, it is very short uh, uh, survey uh, it's hard to just pay attention to probable gaps in time experience so uh, this survey assumes that uh, the time is linear and uh, that there is no any interruptions in the time experience. So uh, one hour uh, in future is equal to one hour in the past. But however, people with uh, drug dependence, they report uh, absolutely a different picture. Uh, that uh, the future can be even the near future can be uh, distant and uh, that uh, the present can be a temporal gap and uh, you see that it uh, is also um, similar to refugees temporal experience so I will just uh, I'm going uh, to the end and then uh, towards the conclusion. Uh, mismatch between social temporalities. It was a topic of uh, social studies in uh, like 50, 40 years ago. Uh, but uh, uh, people uh, implied that social temporality, uh, the temporality of majority social majority is normal and uh, that uh, they implied they all the people have the same temporality all the people not using drugs and uh, um these uh, researchers speculated about uh, um, the desire to synchronize uh with this normal temporality and uh, drug use as an instru instrument for such uh, synchronization. Uh, but uh, the latest uh, research uh, uh, points out that uh, some people uh, are desynchronized, not due to using drugs or uh, their direct uh, psychotropic effects but due to negative stereotypes and uh, need to hide uh, their drug use. This is a factor of uh, desynchronization. So, uh, so here you can see uh, that um, availability does not mean accessibility. And it is also a factor of epistemic injustice because a person having a drug dependence cannot uh, go into a healthcare institute and share 
her or his problems with health, healthcare professionals in uh, the time when uh, she or he tends uh, to do this. For example, uh, long waiting lists. Uh, many people from healthcare institutions, they um, call this lens as a good filter uh, that uh, will be a factor of better outcomes for people who just uh, are willing to wait, for example, a week, uh, a month, uh, half a year for going into a uh, harm reduction program, uh, psych uh, psychological support or something like this. But it can prevent uh, people especially who are depressed or have decreased help from uh, voicing their problems. Um, there was also a takeaway schemes, I guess it was in Australia uh, for methadone prescription for uh, opioid uh, agonist therapy uh, that forced patients to come three times a day. And of course, they um, excluded individuals, they not having uh, such an opportunity to, to come to a sp specific place three times a day, not w once a day as uh, in Poland, uh, you remember the map. But uh, three times a day, it's just uh, we just uh, can hardly imagine how people manage to do this. I'm also uh, referring here to Hannah Picard. Uh, she suggests that uh, one of the ways for overcoming the addiction is imagine a new identity without uh, not related to uh, some substance abuse or drug use. But this imaginative project needs, uh, requires emotional support. And uh, of course, uh, this support should be synchronized with uh, personal life, like personal social life, not the experience, like temporal experience, but um uh, uh, timetable like schedule of uh, personal life because uh, many people with uh, drug uh, dependent they have children they need to uh, to go to the school with their children or to, to go to kindergarten to return and and so on that is why uh, these uh, programs, uh, the work of healthcare institutions uh, should be um, scheduled well to, to fit this uh, plentitude of uh, different personal uh, uh, social temporalities. So I'm going to conclusion. It is my last uh, slide before the literature. Um, so the first one is, uh, that, uh, availability doesn't mean accessibility is that, uh, there are some problems, uh, um, uh, some problems with epistemic injustice and not only uh, related to uh, negative stereotypes or some bad ways to interpret uh, their narratives, but also with social temporality. Uh, my third, uh, my second outcome is uh, about uh, um, uh, testimonial and hermeneutical uh, injustice, not as a concept, but as a tools for uh, searching um, some di different uh, epistemic predicaments. So my hypothesis uh, is that if we start uh, speaking about only negative stereotypes and uh, some interpretive devices, we will overlook these uh, social synchronizations as, as you have seen on my previous slide. And uh, the last one uh, that uh, probably the 
way of uh, addressing these problems from uh, healthcare institutions could be alphabetical. This means that, uh, first of all, uh, they should get rid of uh, stereotypes and uh, uh, give people possibility to speak to testify about their problems. Uh, then they should create uh, a variety of tools uh, for understanding not just uh, healthcare surveys, but uh, some other tools from, I guess, narrative medicine. And finally, improve accessibility of care, uh, taking into account uh, uh, time budgets and uh, different schedules of people with uh, drug dependence, because if they will start uh, with this, and uh, they will and will not uh, uh, deal with our first two problems. Okay, uh, person will come, but will not tell, testify or will not be uh, understood perfectly. So um, thank you for your attention. I will just uh, slowly change the slides with. Uh, literature and you're welcome uh, to ask your questions give your commentaries and sorry for uh, uh, going out of time thank you very much sergey i will open the floor for questions now and we can get thank you maybe we could have a first round of questions here and then we can move to our guests on zoom yeah, Alexander. Thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. I have. Thank you very much for this interesting presentation. Um, I had all sorts of uh, thoughts and ideas while you we were speaking already, but um, um, the one that sort of uh, bugs me the most is uh, something which is related to your points made uh, uh, at the very end uh, in your conclusion. And this is related to, to this um, um, uh, lack of um, uh, uh, social coherence uh, related to this temporality. Would you think that perhaps it would be useful if you would uh, 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 look uh, into more detail and compare the situation of uh, people with any kind of uh, 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 dependencies, any kind of um, addiction, I mean, unwillingful addiction to a drug in terms of a medication, such as people who are insulin dependent or people who are dependent on some other hormonal substitute, because they also face with uh, uh, temporality. For, for uh, people with diabetes, it's like uh, I can survive up to three days. For people who have a Thyroid condition is like I can survive for one month, up to one month without my uh, treatment. So um, um, perhaps it would be worthwhile uh, just for the sake of uh, having a better focus to be able to pinpoint uh, all the difficulties, uh, all people with some kind of addiction, willingful and unwilling face, uh, and then, you know, to have a better focus on what is really like specific for people with uh, the, the, that that uh, use drugs, and um, also uh, it would be interesting if you could somehow could touch upon um, financial aspects of of different substances used because you said that, for example, um, um, the synthetic drugs are um, um, in in rise in terms of uh, users. But um, uh, I can see several reasons for that. Uh, they are not only cheap and uh, relatively easy available, but they can be made of uh, legal substances. So also the, the issue of legality of substances that we are dependent on might have some kind of impact in, in this story. Like, would it matter if uh, people People would be <laughs> would have the possibility of of use drugs legally or not. So just those thoughts. 
not really questions, but just, you know, um, ideas for discussion. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you for your very precise uh, points and uh, comments. Uh, yes, of course, uh, the situation is not uh, unique uh, when we are speaking about um, uh, Patocentric um, epistemic injustice, of course, uh, each patient, each person can face uh, different forms, different types of epistemic injustice. Um, I, I was focused primarily on uh, drug addiction because uh, you see that uh, there are too much specifics of temporal experiences and of uh, uh values uh, of uh, personal values of drugs because people uh, sometimes uh, use them to integrate towards the mainstream society uh or uh, they're using as you mentioned for example as an academic doping or, or something like this that is why i've chosen this uh one uh case to demonstrate different forms uh, different uh, temporal dimensions of epistemic injustice because there are no, not plenty, but I haven't found uh, yet uh, a single paper dedicated uh, fully towards temporal aspects of uh, epistemic injustice in healthcare. Uh, there was uh, a work of Balkan work. I sorry, I just cannot demonstrate. Uh, he addressing the full scale uh, of uh, temporal aspects of different types of epistemic injustice, not only in his gear. It was published uh, a year ago. So I was trying to uh, just make an introduction uh, towards the field of temporality and epistemic injustice. And that is why I'm uh, trying to focus on the, the um, significant case. But of course, you are right, we, we can compare. Uh, and uh, that is um, a really uh, good task for further, I guess, social research and, and uh, so on. Thank you for this and uh, these points. Thank you for, for your lecture. I have two questions. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, it seems to me that uh, in regards to this synchronization problem and the systemic response, as you said, uh, what do you think whether, for example, NGO sector, which would be supported by the government, would be more inclined or more agile to respond to this problem rather than a more systemic institutions, which are, you know, obsessed with another kind of continuity? So in this practical terms, uh, what, according to your theoretical insights and research, would be a, a more more uh, appropriate response to this kind of crisis, which emerges from from migrations and and the needs of people who are drug users and are uh, and are refugees. And the other question refers to Frankfurt's. Uh, I'm, it's more a comment. I don't think actually that you know Frankfurt was portrayed somewhat problematically here because what he actually said is like yes yeah, second order volitions and second order desires are important but on the other hand you know as you know uh, uh, you can be a willing addict and be a person because Harry Frankfurt was a compatibilist and he was trying to say that even if you are a willing willing addict it only it's only needed to be you you are still uh, 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 capable of being an agent and you have agency so that's like a more of a comment and not 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 anything to, to you don't you don't have, don't have to respond yeah thank you yeah uh, thank you uh, Sergeant, for your questions yes i completely agree with you speaking about the first question that uh, ngo sector is more flexible uh, however of course it needs uh, some systematic governmental support okay. and uh, it uh, uh, yes yes Yes, and, uh, yes, uh, and it, it lacks uh, such kind of support in, in many countries, and that is uh, that is a problem, uh, as you have seen in Russia, uh, only NGOs 
have a, a possibility of uh, doing some harm reduction programs, but no uh, systematic governmental programs are on the table even. And uh, speaking about Frankfurt, yes, uh, thank you for your uh, comment. Um, I think that uh, um, I was trying to point out the way how uh, Frankfurtian ideas was uh, used by the also of Cynthia's dilemma. So uh, it is, re of course, it is really uh, oversimplified, but when you are going into some kind of uh, bioethical argument uh, applicable to what's a policy making, decision making, you need to oversimplify. So this uh, uh, philosopher oversimplified Frankfurt in this particular way. Um, of course, uh, Frankfurt is a really um, big uh, philosopher and uh, we, we can just um, express his uh, all of his philosophy in uh, two sentences of course yeah thank you do we have any other question here in the room maybe on zoom yeah please uh, probably people can uh, raise uh, their hands and we will give the floor Okay, while our audience is preparing their question, I, I might have a couple of comments. Okay. Uh, so uh, this was very, very interesting and it is not specifically my topic. So please excuse me if I'm not uh, uh, understanding some things well, but what, what I'm missing uh, here is the connection between your two main topics, migration and drug addiction, because your conclusions are related to the healthcare, how to improve the healthcare system taking into account the problems of temporality that uh, drug, that, that, that uh, people who, so, oh, perfect. Uh, so how, so the, the uh, migration makes uh, even uh, more uh, and deeper problems for uh, people who use drugs, right? But how can we, so your, your conclusions, how can be there, let's say relevant for policies related to he healthcare and uh, uh, related to uh, uh, issues of migration and for migrants. So this is what, what I would like to see. Yeah, thank you for your question. Uh, it is uh, absolutely justified because uh, uh, my presentation stems from uh, just two sources. Uh, one source is a draft of the paper uh, it's kind of a philosophical bioethical paper where we we are dealing with uh, uh, drug dependence and temporal aspects of uh, epistemic injustice. Um, just adding here, uh, topic of uh, migration would be too, too much. We have already three uh, uh, dimensions that we. we can combine addiction, injustice, uh, and temporality. So there are already uh, too much combinations, how I can, we can uh, think about that. However, I um, uh, added, uh, I combined these uh, two topics because um, issues of uh, temporal experience of refugees, forced migrants having drug addiction, they are underscoring uh, some aspects of epistemic injustice. Of course, when you are living, constantly living in, in, the, in the place, uh, you are better synchronized towards the rest of community, towards, uh, you know, uh, how um, kind of NGOs or healthcare institutions work and uh, something like this. But when you are a migrant, you are um, isolated, lost in time in terms of waiting for your legal status. And uh, uh, you just need to combine this with management of harm reduction program. It is really the, the hardest uh, um tasks that uh, a person can face and uh, um it started with the story i was making in depth uh, interviews 
while working on my project uh, right here. Uh, and uh, one of them uh, was a story of a person who is uh, a refugee having drug dependence. So I tried to delve into the topic and uh, make specific contribution as a bioethicist uh, toward the situation of people uh, primarily with uh, drug addiction and uh, being refugees, but uh, it is also relevant with uh, people with drug dependence. It doesn't matter whether they live uh, in, in their hometown or they flee from war and dictatorship or repressions or something like this. So yes, it's true. Uh, that is why I've told that my presentation consists of two parts, uh, like more illustrative and more speculative, normative, bi biotically, uh, philosophically oriented part concerning uh, epistemic injustice. Thank you for, for your question. I think we have a question from the audience. Uh, uh, yes, can, can you read, please? Yes. <laughs> uh, so if we can see the first part of the question, please. So uh, can we use the analogy with the second order desires in epistemology and say that I know that I have the ability to know if a person knows about the opportunities of treatment and av availability of social services, does it create responsibility? And more specifically, a person knows that there are professionals who can help, who know how to deal with the issue, who also do have the addiction, it is responsibility of the person to want and look for help. Okay, uh, that is really a big, uh, big topic. I I really love uh, the topic uh, of uh, Frankfurt and speculation in epistemology and especially in virtue epistemology. But uh, probably here is not the, the best uh, place of um, speculating about epistemic responsibility and uh, in the links uh, to both ethical responsibility, uh, but. Of course, uh, we we can uh, just uh, speculate in uh, this kind of way, but I am not really tend uh, to uh, use this speculation to make uh, some bioethical conclusions or conclusions that uh, can influence decision making process, because uh, that is only speculation. It is not uh, uh, a first uh, person view uh, of course we need uh, to to base our ethical like recommendations on uh, uh, social studies uh, on uh, not on our speculations about uh, um, free will or epistemic uh, responsibility or, or something like this well, we can see that uh, yes uh, probably Sintes dilemma was a perfect uh, uh, like philosophical speculation concerning the arguments, but uh, if we are taking into account uh, its uh, ethical outcomes, they are not uh, uh, appropriate uh, for doing uh, harm reduction programs or um, something like this. So my answer would be so uh, speculation yes uh, uh, i will i will be happy to uh, to speak more about this but uh, not in bioethical terms but in terms of uh, epistemology virtue epistemology primarily thank you do we have any other question from our audience on zoom or here in the room I would also like to know more about your interviews. You said that you um, that you uh, talked with uh, with someone with uh, drug addiction issues and who is also a migrant. So is your research uh, so perhaps a little bit more methodology? Is your research or paper based on uh, empirical your empirical studies or only on the um, literature that we uh, saw here? Yes, it is based uh, only on the literature. We just mm -hmm. one interview 
the case, but uh, the case here is not to demonstrate it because there are plentitude of research uh, that speak about uh, accessibility, availability, time budgeting, and, and so on. And of course, I'm not uh, ready uh, to publish uh, this uh, research be because it is really hard to anonymize mice but making it uh, still uh, illustrative uh, that the case because if I specify the place uh, the gender uh, the, the age uh, because of course time budgeting is uh, correlated with with the age uh, gender and uh, uh, some other personal uh, traits uh, personal information and uh, of course uh, people with drug addictions they are extremely vulnerable in terms of legal some kind of uh, probably legal prosecution uh in uh, in different countries probably in their homeland and of course uh, these people are also vulnerable due to uh, kind of political instability and that is why i'm really not ready to to publish this, it was uh, the starting point of my interest uh, towards the problem. I was uh, also interested in uh, epistemic injustice, in drug addiction studies, uh, in temporality, but uh, here that was a uh, impetus to go into this and to uh, at least draft a paper about epistemic injustice uh, and temporal dimensions of uh, experience of uh, being drug dependent. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. If you do not have any other questions, then we can greet our guest. Thank you. And for your uh, uh, questions, it was, I was really pleased uh, and really glad to have this presentation uh, with you. Thank you for your attention once again.